Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Peter Spears is an award-winning producer. He's an actor, a director, a writer, and he produced the Academy Award-winning Nomadland for Best Picture, the Academy Award-winning Call Me By Your Name for Best Adapted Screenplay, which was also awarded, uh, nominated for Best, Best Picture, and so many other films and so many other awards. I need to talk to him about all of them, including his newest projects. Peter, thank you for gracing the Storyteller's Microphone. Oh, thank you for having me. I'd like to jump right in with preparing for your time with me today. I got a sense almost in the way that in the old days, I could tell a Peter Oselznik, a David Oselznik movie by light and shadow. By learning more about your films, I get such a distinct feel for what Peter Spears wants to put in a movie. Something about pacing, something about otherness. Can you talk a little bit about what draws you to a movie? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's varied, certainly. Uh, I've, I've, I've sort of been drawn to the kinds of movies I've made as a producer are the sorts of movies that I've loved as a moviegoer, as an actor, uh, as a writer. Uh, and and there sort of seem to be a kind of vanishing uh, breed of, of movies. Uh, you know, I don't... Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough at this point in my career to be able to be a champion for these sorts of smaller stories and uh, stories that that go and you know tell something more about the internal uh, life of their characters. Um, the the otherness certainly a kind of queerness in its most broad interpretation of the word. Uh, you know, I've been things that have resonated for me, and I've tried to. Uh, find ways to um, to move those stories along and, and, and get them made. You know, with with Call Me by Your Name was the first movie I produced and made. Um, it was, you know, a ten year odyssey of trying to figure out how to put all those pieces together. Mostly because nobody understood really in a more traditional way what the movie was. You know, they just were like, well. You know, nobody dies of a horrible sickness. Nobody's parents disown them. Nobody like, you know, what, what are the stakes? And, and, you know, for me, it was the stakes were the stakes of the heart. And, and the story was as important a kind of story uh, as any sort of, you know, big budgeted sort of, you know, uh, effects film perhaps or something. Uh, so, you know, it took some convincing and finally the ability to just make the movie elsewhere, you know, by maybe going and making it as a European co-production where there's more of a tradition still of making these sorts of films. Uh, a lot of the movies I've made have been co-productions and the ability also to um, finally, you know, show people like, OK, I can't keep describing what this movie is like. I think I just have to show you what the movie is. And of course, once we made the movie, you know, people found it and and a lot of people really, you know, came to champion it also. And a lot of, you know, in that way, as you can imagine, even some folks who had said they didn't get it before, you know, in, in the sort of abstract before it was made coming around to being like, ah, I see now, you know, and, and the good news was, is it helped pave the way to make more movies like that. Well, you did show them and they needed to see that. I think it's interesting that you talked about how it's a smaller story. And there certainly is in Nomadland, you opened my eyes in that film. I did not realize the breadth of people who live such a nomadic existence. So they are smaller stories, but they are huge in impact. Did you have any idea that that would win the Academy Award for Best Picture? I, I, I mean... No, no, is the answer. You have never had any idea that that'll be the case. I, I, I had, we certainly had hopes that we would make something special and unique. I had met, I had known Frances through my husband who had been her agent uh, for uh, many years. We had never worked together, but while we were on the award circuit for going to lots of those festivals and award shows for Call Me By Your Name, 
Francis was doing the same circuit with three billboards. And so we got to spend a lot of time together. And Chloe had her movie, The Writer, Chloe Zhao, the director. Um, so we, we had gotten to sort of under, know each, all each other beyond just sort of passing hellos. And we came up with the idea that perhaps this book could be a, uh, you know, a movie of some sort. I, I, again, I mentioned my husband, he was the first one to, to read the book and he, he gave it to me and to Francis and, and said, maybe there's a movie here. Now, when we first optioned it, we thought that the movie would be Francis playing the lead character from the book. Um, Chloe had a different idea when she got saw it and she thought, ah, oh, well, what if we, I love this, but what if we did something a little different? What if we created a new character and lived amongst the folks out there living this way, the nomads and, um, and find the story, you know, and, and we ended up finding a story that again, while certainly new to many of us, that there was, there was a community of people living this way. What at the end of the day the movie is, is a story of a woman dealing with grief and the loss of community. And uh, as the gods of cinema would have it, by the time we were done shooting after five months, um, you know, Chloe had been hired to do a Marvel film. And so she left and went off to London to do that film and didn't edit the movie uh, for several months, our movie. Uh, she was immersed in this new film. And then COVID happened, everything shut down and she was in Ohio at her house and she had all the footage from Nomadland and she just spent several weeks alone editing that movie and, and called and said, hey, it's done. And, you know, I don't know, would the movie have resonated in the same ways a year earlier if it had stayed on that sort of time frame that it was on originally? It, I, you know. The fact was now we were all as a, it wasn't just one woman's story of, of grief and loss. It was now all of us had been experiencing so much, you know, grief and loss in the first year of the, of the pandemic. And, uh, and I think the movie really just was the right movie at the right time in that way. So timing is really interesting. You know, you talk about Call Me By Your Name, and that was, I, I love the expression, you know, you're an overnight success, but it, that was a 10-year overnight success yeah. to uh, be nominated for Best Picture and then to win the Academy uh, for Best Adapted uh, Screenplay. How important is timing then? I mean, you just talked about it again. Yeah, Is I mean, that something I'm, you can pick? Yeah, no. I mean, you just, I think you have to keep several irons in the fire, working on several projects at a time uh, and moving them along. You never know. A strike will happen, you know, like we are moving, we're working on a couple projects right now and, and they, you know, had been until lately stopped in their path with, you know, the idea of the strike. And certainly, as I said, the pandemic before that with another movie. And so timing is a, part of it, the, you know, the, the vagaries of, of, of life, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the fate smiles or frowns in different ways. Um, you know, we weather and, you know, the fact that like with Call Me By Your Name in particular, that movie could only be shot in the summertime. So you really only had one time a year to make that movie. Every year we would be sort of lined up trying to get it made for summer, but if something fell out, an actor left, a director changed, we have to wait a whole nother year to be back on that runway. Uh, and so, you know, there's a million things that can factor into that, into how you get a movie made or, or the challenges in getting a movie made. Um, and while, you know, it was 10 years for Call Me By Your Name, Nomadland came together in 10 months. Um, I've got another project that is coming out uh, later this year called Drift with Cynthia Arrivo. It's a, a movie that Cynthia and I have been working on together for now longer than 10 years. Um, it was a movie actually that Bill Paxton had been wanting to make. Uh, he had optioned the book first and he had met Cynthia and wanted to make with Cynthia. And he had asked me uh, several weeks before he was going to have open heart surgery to uh, help him produce that film. He had seen Call Me By Your Name and really loved it. Uh, and I said, of course, I'd help him. He uh, was another friend of, of my husband's and a longtime client. Uh, and so I think looking back on it now, 
he was probably trying to get his affairs in order in case the surgery didn't go well. It was, it was open heart surgery. And, uh, and sadly, as we know, it, it was, it had complications and he passed away. So as a sort of memory to him and in his honor and memory, we've been trying to get that movie made and it's a tiny film and it's a refugee story. And it's uh, a film that we made uh, with some of my partners from Call Me By Your Name, producing partners. Uh, and we shot in Greece uh, a few years ago now. And uh, Cynthia gives just an incredible performance. I mean, really, truly one of, like, I, you've never seen anything like this performance, but a tiny little movie. And again, you talk about timing. You know, it's a story about a woman whose family was massacred in, um, uh, in Liberia when Charles Taylor was deposed and uh, how where she finds herself uh, on a Greek island, uh, you know, alone and, and untethered from the world and her beginning to take the first steps to trying to put her life back together. And of course, who would have known we'd be living through such times right now with so much of trying to understand in a, and really put a face on and, and, and remember the humanity of all these refugees uh, all over the world uh, and where they are. So I, you know, uh, the way, again, coming back to your original question, the way timing works in, in, in every aspect of, of, of our storytelling, uh, whether it's at the movie makers or it's writers or journalists or whatever, plays a really big part. I've become fascinated in recent months with just producing. Quite honestly, I just, you know, the credits roll, I go, there's a producer, that's nice. He or <laughs> she is the person who gets the money together. But it is really such an amazing combination of puppet master, God, getting the money, product placement, cast, pro other partnerships. How did you come to be, well, love, be so good at producing? Well, it's a skill set, I mean, that I think I've always had to some degree. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of like a clipboard and a punch list. And I like to, you know, check things off and, and, and be, you know, in sort of control of projects and things. Like I, and, and as I began at my career as an actor, I was always coming in very late in the creative process. Uh, it was really, you know, projects had already been cooking for a long time and developing and, and, and you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, of need for me to come in with sort of my artistic voice other than my ability to read the lines and deliver them in a way that was what the director and writer had hoped for. Um, and so I began to also do some writing, uh, which was, uh, you know, a little more of that ability to be involved with the process. Uh, but slowly just, you know, and then I directed a little bit, but I kind of just step by step realized I wanted to be, I wanted to be there from soup to nuts. I wanted to find the project. I wanted to read the book. Usually in my case, I do mostly film adaptations of books. I want to find the writer. I want to work with the writer on the script. I'm going to look for the money. I'm going to work with the director, uh, help to find the director and work with the director on casting and be on set for the, uh, you know, all the shooting, be involved in the editing, giving notes to the director, uh, involved in the marketing. Involved, I mean, you know, so every bit of it now as a producer, as a creative producer, um, is something I have a hand in and something that uh, an ability for me to certainly, I think as my biggest job as a producer is to be the champion of the director's voice and make sure the director's vision is realized. But in, but, but it is in a kind of, you know, dance with also being supportive of that and offering in ways that are helpful opinions, knowing when to step back when opinions aren't necessarily needed or juggling many opinions from lots of different people, you know, other producers, financiers, studio, and finding, you know, let's make sure that this doesn't become an amalgam of too many ideas and too many visions, but that we kind of keeping our eye on the, on the ball here. Um, so I sort of, I don't know that I could have done this at 20 or 30 or even 40 years old. Uh, it was a good career for me to, to segue into by at 50 because I'd learned some of the other things 
I knew so many different areas of the business. I'd been an actor, I'd been a director, I'd been a writer. I, you know, so I, I had a shorthand often with all these folks as a producer. And, uh, and it's been nice to uh, find, you know, morph into, into this at this stage. And then also to be the guy, the producer who can be the one who has the patience and the time to push those more challenging projects up the hill. You know, the ones that are not as easy to, for the money people to see and stuff. I'm amazed at the level of detail and the level of your involvement. I would think it's, it's fabulous to be that involved on set, making notes, et cetera. You're also very involved in post-production. You're in post-production now on, on Swift Horses, I believe. Yes, that's right. Uh, so we are now that the strike is over, our actors are able to come back and do some ADR work, you know, looping and, and, and some line changes. You know, our writer can can fix some lines here and there, you know, and all the things we discover in editing uh, where, you know, this is the work of that moment now. Um, so we are, uh, so yes, we very involved in that. Now, not all producers are. Some producers are, as you described earlier, just money folks, you know, and they come in and they're just going to give the money. And usually when you're watching a movie, that's denoted by the credit of executive producer. So when you see executive in movies, when you see executive producer, it's different in television, um, that often is these are the people who were involved financially. When And the producers as a separate uh, category are the folks who may have been involved financially, but they also were, you know, carrying a little more of the creative uh load of of this of, of a project and um you know the nuts and bolts of it line you know how is the money being allocated Dave? not just writing a check but how are we using that money every day and you know what's the budgets and what are the scheduling and what's all that kind of uh, stuff often that's also called a lot more specifically the person who only does that and doesn't have anything really creatively to do with the project is a line producer. So the line producer has the budget. The line producer is dealing with the daily schedule. Me as a regular, as a creative producer is also involved with that, but I'm sort of the person kind of running between all those areas and keeping everyone sort of together and, and making sure the train arrives in the station. I love it. In 2020, you created your own company, Corcordium. Uh, loosely translated um, Heart of Hearts, which I thought was absolutely a delightful name, thinking about how much you loved um, films. But of course, I discovered that as I was watching Bones and All, <laughs> I had a totally different spin on why you might have called uh, your company that. For those of our viewers who don't know about this film, which has just come out, uh, it is a must-see um I want to say it's about cannibalism, but it's not. It's a love story. No, no. I mean, cannibalism in this movie is, is yeah, it's a love story. And cannibalism is a metaphor for otherness uh, or a kind of queerness. And so it is, uh, it's a sort of, you know, Grand Guignon sort of uh, experiment that was really also a wonderful reuniting of, of, of me with, as a producer, getting to work again with uh, Luca Guadagnino, who directed Call Me By Your Name, and Timothy Chalamet, uh, who starred so beautifully in, in Call Me By Your Name. Uh, and so it's, uh, yes, very different uh, milieu, but in lots of ways, so very much, so wonderfully, everything people love about Luca is in that movie, you know, the the, the singular vision, the, the, the you know, the, the, the even if it was a kind of horror story, uh, it's just, you know, the attention to detail and uh, the mise-en-scene of it all is so rich and so deep. And you've got this incredible performance from Mark Rylance also. Uh, and you've got visiting and coming back again, Michael Stuhlbarg, who played the father so beautifully in Call Me By Your Name, unrecognizable here in this movie, playing, you know, a, a very out there character. Um, but it was... Uh, you know, it was a little more uh, rock and roll maybe than the Call Me By Your Name. If the Call Me By Your Name was a little more, you know, uh, a beautiful kind of uh, classical piece, uh, classical music piece, you know, this is a, is, is a little more. And Trenton Atticus, you know, uh, who did the score uh, is, is, is just, you know, 
really, I, I think, a pretty special film. And people who are finding it now are are having a really great experience uh, of, of the movie. And and to be clear, Corcordium actually, I hadn't even thought about that. It's sort of the irony of it as regards <laughs> uh, Bones and All, and, and in particular one scene. Uh, but Heart of Hearts actually comes from the book of Call Me By Your Name. And it is in Latin and it's something Oliver wrote to Elio on a postcard when he leaves. He sends him a credit, it just says Heart of Hearts in his oh. sort of way of thing. And so it's not in the movie, but it's in the book. And it's, you know, uh, for those, it's like, if you know, you know, sort of thing. And uh, so anyway, that's... Uh, Oh, That's thank you for sharing that, that yeah, part. Sure. Yes, trust me, I wouldn't have put those things together. No, if no, you wouldn't have. But that's a beautifully cast film, too, um, Bones and All. I just Yeah. In the movies that I've seen of yours, and now I need to go back and do more, you don't seem in a rush to tell a story. And is that true of your other films, or is it just... I, I love that you don't, you're not in a rush. Yeah. I mean, I like to sit, I like films to sit. I mean, these are the sorts of directors I like to work with. So, you know, uh, but yes, I respond to directors and stories that want to sit with our characters a bit and get to know them. And uh, on Swift Horses, the new movie we're doing is, is a little more plot forward. And uh, it's, a you know, not really a heist film, but in some ways there's some, uh, go, there's, there's, yeah, there's just more going on story-wise, uh, which, you know, uh, means you've got to be very judicious in what you're going to use that way to tell the story and what you use to help continue to develop the characters emotionally. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember seeing Nomadland um, during the pandemic because nobody was going to movie theaters, all the IMAX movie theaters were, were closed. And, uh, but because in no, none of the big, they, you know, everyone had held back their big Marvel films and their big, you know, uh, superhero films uh, until the, you know, they wanted to see where, when people would start coming back to the theaters. So IMAX had the idea, they said, well, let's show Nomadland in IMAX. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what that is like on IMAX to see a story that intimate, that slow in the development the, the just sitting on Francis's face in that massive, you know, format uh, and just being with her in those in those ways. And, you know, it was really transformative. Like I they should show a lot more movies than IMAX in that way, because uh, it held your attention as much as any chase sequence, as much as any sort of, you know, space battle. Uh, and, and maybe even more so in ways and, you know, and it wasn't, and we were just fine to sit as long as the camera and the director wanted to sit in the moment, uh, with them. And, um, so, you know, that's the magic of movies and that's for me, and that's the sort of, that's the spiritual part of movies. And, uh, and that's where I go for that kind of, um, you know, experience for something that sort of touches the, the human spirit. Uh, so I don't want to race through that. I want, I want to sit with that for a moment and, and uh, have been lucky enough to find directors who feel the same way. Does winning an Academy Award change you or change your work? Ooh, I mean, no, it's, I mean, it doesn't change me and the work is still the work. It's like, you know, uh, but the the ability that maybe uh, something doesn't take ten years to make the case of why that might be a movie is is certainly there. You know, it's very much um, the fact now that like if they don't quite get what it is and it doesn't quite make sense if you're pitching this film to somebody, they might take a little more of like a flyer uh, on it because they're just like, okay, you know, maybe that. But but. But what it also has done is really when a, when that happens is the ability for people to come see movies that they wouldn't have seen, you know, uh, is remarkable. So the fact that Nomadland, Call Me By Your Name, 
you know, all these films will be on airplanes now. They're on, you know, they're on wherever, wherever it is, folks are going to find the movie in ways that they wouldn't have before. So it sort of guarantees a, a little more of a life for a film sure. and in ways that when you've spent so put so much of yourself into the making of it, feels very gratifying to know that it's going to, you know, has a little asterisk next to it in film history. So it's nice, nice feeling. I'm sure. I am very struck by your collaborativeness. When I read your bio, it's filled with other people's names. You know, it doesn't say I produced this, I directed that. It's in there, but you are very much other focused. You, you, would you talk about that? Well, I mean, that's the nature of, the, of, of independent filmmaking. Like we, it takes a village, it takes two villages, it takes villages from all around the world. Like we have, you know, all the movies I, I've made have been, you know, had had folks from in all the departments and different financiers and all of that coming together um, to, to tell a story because we were all moved by it in some way. So I... I, I guess, you know, for me that you start with this idea, this sort of perfect idea of what something might be, but as you start to bring together your, your co-creators and collaborators and your fellow filmmakers, it becomes its own story and you sort of sit back a little bit and you let it start to find its own way, you know, like a child, like child, like being a parent and, um, and you're going, and, and when they ultimately, you know, take those first steps and go out into the world, you, you're sort of, you know, you hold your breath and you wonder that, like, did this collaboration, like, did you capture this kind of lightning in a bottle or not? And, uh, and the more you, the more you, like most things, right, that lesson over and over, the more you release, the more you let it sort of do its thing, the more it, it, it flies. And in the more, in the less you try to control that. So, so it's about, I love the collaboration of working with all these incredible artists and, and I love the, uh, the give and the take. And I love the, the, the ability to tell stories in all the different ways and to go around the, I've been lucky enough to travel around the world and find, and find different collaborators and, and, and learn different ways that they tell stories and make movies and to come back with that. And, and it's like constantly for me, like being in like film school over and over again, each movie feels like a whole another year of another great opportunity to learn about movie making uh, and so much to catch up on, right? The history of it's so long. And uh, so to get, to have the, to the gratefulness at this point to be able to, be in the sandbox with all these folks and making something uh, is is great. And uh, I know it won't last forever. So I'm hopeful to to get to do it, um, you know, for as much as possible, but to still champion those those stories that are, you know, don't get championed enough. And uh, and I really feel like Drift that's coming out is one of those movies uh, on Swift Horses will be too. And uh, I think that they'll feel like more, hopefully a part of like, you'll continue to see that connective tissue between all these stories. And you're also really committed to helping others find their light, if you will. You're involved with Outset Young Filmmakers Project, which I thought sounded really wonderful that you help other people play in the sandbox. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a project from a lot uh, that we uh, co-created uh, many years ago now uh, when we sort of realized that there was in Hollywood, um, it was very easy for the kids of like the Hollywood executives and studio folks and people who would kind of already found their way through all the doors and gates of, of Hollywood and were already working, you know, those kids seem to have the ability to network in a sort of entree into the business um, that kids who were not as fortunate to be born, you know, into like having parents who were doing this already uh, were, you know, that, that they were, that there was more of a wall there that they didn't see that even though they were growing up in Los Angeles, they didn't see a pathway for themselves to find, you know, to be working in this company town in this way, right? And in all the different ways, you know, if they did know about it, they thought, oh, I have to be an actor, I have to be a director. But there's, you know, hundreds, thousands of different ways you can be a part of working in, in making movies and television. And so we thought, and 
how specifically with the with the Gay and Lesbian Center of Los Angeles and with OutFest, the Gay and Lesbian uh, Transgender Bisexual um, uh, Film Festival here, thought that like, you know, how can we create a mentoring program for those young people uh, that not only shows them Yes, they learn some tools like they'll make a project and they'll and they'll start with an idea and they'll work together to make like a short film or a system. And, and, you know, at the end of many months, they have something to kind of show for it. But more importantly, what they have also made are contacts and networking. And they've learned they've met adults in the program, you know, in, in, in the program, they've met adults who are also working in Hollywood in lots of different ways. Uh, and so they've begun the process of opening those doors for themselves uh, when they graduate, you know, if they go to school, so many often don't, they go right into working. Uh, and, uh, and this has opened a lot of doors for a lot of young people, uh, to find uh, their way to help telling stories also. Peter, thank you for helping so many people tell stories. Thank you for sharing yours and for giving us such amazing stories throughout the years. I look forward to Drift and On Swift Horses and to so many more things. Thanks for being with us on The Storytellers. Thank you, Grace. It was nice to spend a Sunday this way. Take care. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.